Fukushima. The name alone is enough to conjure fear in the hearts of anyone living along the west coast of North America or on the eastern seaboard of Asia. To many, Fukushima is our generation's Chernobyl and a reminder of the deadly consequences of tapping into the almighty atom to fuel our modern lifestyles. Following the nuclear disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, some surveys have shown that public opinion on nuclear power is dropping in Europe, and many countries are now planning to decrease their reliance on nuclear power. In the US, the public remains almost evenly split after taking a tumble from almost 60% in favor for nuclear power pre-Fukushima. And yet, while the overall health effects of Fukushima were far less than expected, and certainly far short of every alarmist's worst predictions, the world at large remains extremely fearful of the nuclear monster. Starting construction shortly before the Fukushima disaster though, Russia's floating nuclear power plant will be fired up this fall. Predictably, it has come under intense international opposition from groups such as Greenpeace, who fear another nuclear disaster polluting the ocean with radioactive waste. But are these fears well founded? And is Russia flirting with a disaster that could leave its northern coasts barren of life for decades or more? Displayed boldly on its side, the academic Lomonosov sports a diagram of an atom, the international symbol for nuclear power, with a hull that's 474 feet long and a displacement of 21,500 tons. The academic is the world's only floating nuclear power plant. Nuclear power has been used at sea before. Notably, the Soviet Union created battle cruisers and icebreakers fueled by nuclear power, and the US Navy has for decades relied on nuclear power to operate its mighty aircraft carriers. Both the Russian and American Navy, as well as a few other navies, all operate nuclear-powered submarines. Yet the academic differs in that its sole purpose is to serve as a floating power plant rather than power the ship it's installed on. The ultimate destination for the academic is the northern port of Pevek, deep in the Arctic Circle. There, power cables will be run to the vessel and the nuclear reactor will power the port and town built around it. Though a land-based nuclear power plant already exists there, the academic will replace that facility and allow the decommission of its aging reactors. Those are not the only plans for the academic though, as the Russians see the floating nuclear power station being sent to other port cities and industrial plants to provide much needed electricity. Eventually, Russia plans on building a small fleet of these floating nuclear power plants and use them to power remote facilities and even offshore gas and oil platforms. With a power output of 70 megawatts, just one of these ships can provide enough electricity for 100,000 people. Yet even within Russia, there's been stiff opposition to the academic, and both foreign and even Russian cities lodged complaints over the initial route that the academic was going to take, forcing a new route and delay in its delivery. Greenpeace, meanwhile, has collected collected over 11,000 signatures in Russia alone, all calling for the plan to be scrapped altogether. Similar opposition in the US scrapped plans to build a floating nuclear power plant off of New Jersey shore back in the 1960s, but the Russian government has not shown any signs of shutting down the academic. So could the academic Lomonosov be a floating Chernobyl? First, the academic uses a new generation of nuclear reactors, which enjoys the benefits of vastly updated safety systems. The KLT-40 reactor on board the academic differs greatly from the reactors used in either the Fukushima Daiichi power plant or the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which was itself a disaster caused by completely avoidable human error. In fact, the reactor used aboard the academic is similar to those used aboard Russia's nuclear-powered ballistic missile sub Marines. And as has been shown in the past, these reactors are able to be sunk to the bottom of the sea and raised then put back into operation safely. In fact, for a nuclear reactor to pose a serious environmental hazard, a slew of very specific catastrophes must take place in order to breach the containment vessel, and the greatest fear facing the academic, that of a tsunami sinking the ship it's housed in, simply could not lead to such a breach. The KLT-40 reactors aboard the academic have the same features of most other nuclear reactors, such as control rods, which can be lowered in an emergency in order to absorb neutrons and thus stop the nuclear chain reaction at the heart of the reactor. As a pressurized water reactor though, the KLT-40 also features three additional different methods of achieving a termination of nuclear fission by flooding the reactor with cooling water impregnated with boron from three different sources. Compare that with the boiling water reactors at Fukushima, which were designed in the 1960s and featured only a single source and method to cool the control rods that stopped nuclear fission. 
But is a tsunami in the Arctic even possible? Well, given its remoteness, it's no surprise that there's very little data available on Arctic tsunamis and their frequency. What is known is that the Arctic is considered one of the most stable undersea geologic regions in the world. With very infrequent earthquakes which peak at about a magnitude of 7.5, the greatest threat of tsunamis come from undersea landslides, with scientists discovering evidence of a particularly powerful tsunami occurring 8200 years ago, with waves estimated at 20 meters. Other tsunamis have occurred in Arctic regions, such as the 2017 Greenland tsunami which killed four people, yet this was a tsunami generated by a huge landslide across a fjord from the village it struck, and it was not generated by undersea activity such as happened in Fukushima. With no mountains across the water from the academic's planned location, there's no risk of a similar event striking the ship. Even if it did though, tsunamis are very rarely ever dangerous to ships, and in the famous 2004 December tsunami that struck East Asia, thousands of boaters and even recreational divers a mile or two from the shore barely even noticed the passing tsunami. That's because the energy of the tsunami wave passed by in a column a few feet wide under the surface and was channeled into a mighty wave by the increasingly shallow coastline as it neared land. If the academic was caught in a tsunami, it would likely barely even notice the passing wave beneath its hull. In the end, nuclear power has been used at sea in far riskier applications for decades now, powering military warships all around the world. Several disasters at sea and the loss of nuclear craft have all proven the safety of nuclear power, and these were exclusively ships that were operating in extreme circumstances. The academic will be required to perform no such hardships, and will instead sedately sit anchored offshore for years years at a time. Fears of the academic harboring a nuclear disaster are greatly misplaced, and in fact the use of nuclear power will help ensure that global warming coal, oil, or gas plants are not needed to power remote ports along Russia's northern coast. New developments in spent nuclear fuel recycling also promise to eliminate nearly all of the most long-lived radioactive elements, requiring safe storage of spent fuel for decades, rather than centuries or more as is currently the case. As the world faces the now uncertain effects of global warming, nuclear Nuclear power promises to help fill the gaps between renewable sources, and accidents such as Fukushima should serve as a call to action to upgrade any remaining and obsolete reactors, not to ban nuclear power altogether.